Uh, this event's being streamed live on YouTube. If you have social media open, that is, and it's also being recorded and will be on the IES uh, YouTube channel where you can get all, um, quite a large range of our past events. That's, that's really worth having a look at. I think most of you probably are, but for anyone not familiar with um, the Institution of Environmental Sciences, my own sort of short description is this. We exist to provide environmental professionals with the support they need to make a difference in their working lives, but also to use the voices of those professionals to make change at a level of policy as well as practice. Um, and that second part is, is increasingly important and the incredible work that Joseph and Ethne have done on the vision statement is very much um, embracing that spirit and bringing a large number of voices into talking about the future. And our membership spans consultancies, industry, academia, government and arm's length bodies. Um, but beyond that work with the profession, I'm sure a lot of you here represent those sorts of organisations. Uh, but we also engage with universities through what is the largest accreditation scheme of environmental programmes anywhere in the world. And so I hope we also welcome some of you here who are at the university stage of your career. We really, really value your membership and input as well. Uh, we work with policymakers through our policy outreach uh, at national and local level, increasingly at local level, um, as we form new relationships there, and with the public through our public engagement work and, and very strong open access philosophy. And the Burtwood Lecture, this lecture has welcomed many fantastic speakers over the year, in, years, including Lord, Lord Deben, the recent outgoing chair of the Climate Change Committee, Jonathan Porritt, Bob Watson, Tony Juniper, Julia Slinger, and Caroline Lucas last year for our 50th anniversary. And tonight we'll be welcoming Pro uh, Professor Robert Constanza, who'll be talking about societal therapy for a sustainable well-being future. However, before we do that, we have um, something else very important to do. Um, so I want to welcome two of um, IES's key staff, Joseph Lewis, the IES's policy lead, um, and Ethne, our communities and partnership lead. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of what they've been doing, they, they've just um, finished producing for I, IES, uh, IES this very important document. Um, over the past year, um, they've been working on a, a whole year horizon scanning and foresight project the future of ES23, uh, and the purpose of this has been to help our sector plan ahead, uh, manage risk, and support that critical transition to sustainable society. And this document, which I hope you all have, uh, is the culmination of that work. Uh, so, and it's being launched tonight, um, and I really encourage you to read it, and, and also let us know your, your thoughts and disseminate it to your, your colleagues. And that vision is, um, just to encapsulate it, is, is, is a future where environmental scientists are knowledgeable, skilled, diverse, We've, we attach a lot of importance to that, and trusted. And their role will help people, all of us, everyone, to solve environmental challenges and co-create, importantly, not just tell, uh, but co-create a sustainable society where people and nature thrive. And so Ethne and Joseph will give you um, some more details about the vision. So please join me in welcoming them. Um, thank you for that introduction, Julie. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the launch of Transforming the Planet, our vision for the future of environmental science. Today, Joseph and I are going to briefly introduce what our vision for the environmental science is, provide some context on how we came to this vision, and discuss some of the implications of our findings for the environmental science sector and wider society. So this work is a culmination of our year-long Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight project, which brought together the environmental science community to discuss key factors influencing the sector and provided a forum for discussion around what the future of environmental science should look like. And over the course of the year, we delved into five key themes to frame the conversations, looking at megatrends, the evolving nature of science, the regulatory landscape, the changing workforce, and the jobs of environmental scientists. The project involved extensive member engagement, as well as engagement with external environmental experts. Over 30 different stakeholder organizations were involved, including government departments, environmental NGOs, academics, and funding organizations. 
Over the course of the year, we held more than 20 dedicated events, which attracted over 80 contributors and over 850 attendees, underlining the rich interdisciplinary perspectives feeding into the project. This was ref re reflected in our theme mapping of the work. 661 themes were mapped from these discussions, with over 1,300 connections identified between them. This provides a small insight into the complexity of the sector and underlines the vital need for taking a systems view of environmental challenges. These themes were then distilled into key areas which provide the foundation of our vision of the future of environmental science and recommendations on how we can achieve that future, which you can find in the document you've got. Our vision is underpinned by the understanding that humanity has everything it needs to create a better future, but that in order to achieve a better future, we need transformative action to translate capability to solutions. Our vision is therefore one where environmental scientists are knowledgeable, skilled, diverse and trusted and are engaged in the transformation. It is one where people have access to the relevant science to help them solve environmental challenges and to co-create a sustainable society where people and nature thrive. So how can we achieve this future? Findings from our project highlighted a number of key areas. Don't worry, I'm only going to briefly touch on some of these. There are principles of interdisciplinarity, systems thinking, and sustainability will need to be central to the development of solutions in order to make them transformative and to allow for the development of solutions with multiple benefits. This will require collaboration across disciplines and sectors and porosity to new knowledge and approaches. Environmental scientists will need to engage full use of the tools available to them to support this vision, harnessing the new opportunities that technological development brings and managing their associated risks. Unlocking the value of environmental data will be important, including making full use of novel data sources to support real-time monitoring, along with modelling and predicting future change. Employing the principle of lifelong learning to support upskilling in the existing workforce, along with the development of environmental education for future environmental scientists, will be needed to foster key skills in the sector, encompassing technical, digital, enabling and systems thinking skills. Those enabling skills, such as science communication, will be particularly important for supporting environmental scientists as acting as agents of change and developing a science public policy interface which empowers people to make evidence-based decisions. And fundamental to all of this will be embedding environmental justice throughout environmental work and focusing on targeted action to improve equity, diversion, diversity and inclusion in the sector so that the environmental sciences are representative of the society they serve. Taken together, the findings of the project help to uncover a path to a society that is underpinned by the principle of environmental improvement and that places our society in a mutual relationship with nature, protecting and enhancing ecosystem functioning and services and delivering a just transition for all. I'm now going to hand over to Joseph, who is going to talk a bit more about next steps from this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ethne. Uh, what comes next? Very important question. It's very easy at the end of a long project to be self-congratulatory and feel like the work is done, but really the hard part is only just beginning. And I was struck watching the state open opening of Parliament today by the notion that we're very much at a turning point. We've made a lot of progress to get where we are now, but nowhere near enough to reap the benefits of a sustainable future. And at times, I know it may feel like we're losing progress or that we're farther away from our environmental goals than we've ever been. But despite that, we cannot abandon hope for a better future because the first step to creating the world you want to see is imagining that it can exist, knowing what it looks like and what stands in the way to making it real. And that's really what, what this vision seeks to do, uh, to show how environmental science can overcome the challenges along the way to a sustainable society. And if you only take one message away from our vision of the future, uh, it should be that optimism and rationality are not opposite positions. Optimism is the rational conclusion of the evidence, because as long as society acts in a way that is informed by the evidence, we have all the reason to be optimistic. Because the evidence shows that people care about nature. While the It Best Values assessment showed that nature isn't properly valued in policymaking, it made clear that the overwhelming number of ways that we as people value the natural world and the benefits of a healthy environment. And the evidence also shows that people want greener policies. Just last month, the think tank uh, Public First published new polling, which demonstrated that policy platforms are more popular when they include pro-environmental policies like investment in renewable energy, and are less popular when they include anti-environment policies or policies which delay action to protect the environment. And all of that evidence shows that those policies can transform the planet. 
we set out an approach to transforming society and the economy in, in our vision for the future, and you can read that one yourselves, but the sheer mass of evidence underpinning reports like the IPCC's latest synthesis report should give us considerable confidence that solutions are attainable, affordable, and achievable in practice. So, what does come next? Our vision has immediate implications for how the IES will create change within our environmental science, in our interactions with policymakers, and across society. Our capacity to create change is most powerful within our own community. Science must be the bedrock on which transformation of society is built. So this vision will shape the way that we support the sector in becoming, as we've said a couple of times already, knowledgeable, skilled, diverse, and trusted. And then we need to think, work with people to create the future that they're looking for, because science can't fall into the trap of dictating a single approach to a sustainable society, which would be as ineffective as it would be illegitimate. So finally, then, we need policymakers to be consistently evidence-informed in policymaking, providing the healthy environment that people value. Our vision sets out how we can forge those relationships, how we can demystify the evidence underpinning solutions, and how we can use the implementation of those solutions to achieve transformative change. The courage to commit to action on sustainability requires that we have the certainty that only evidence provides, and the shared vision that only comes from bringing together science, people, policy, and the planet. So even as we reflect on recent decisions, and, and after Julie hands over to Professor Costanza, as we spend the evening thinking about the scale of the predicament we face and the therapy we need to help society reimagine its relationship with growth, please remember that this is a vision that we not only must achieve, but which we can achieve. Not because we're optimists or because we really want it to happen, but because the evidence tells us that we have everything we need to begin creating a sustainable society. Now that we've taken the first step, now that we've imagined that such a world can exist, we know what it looks like, and we know everything that stands in our way and how we can overcome it. What comes next is turning that vision into reality, convening environmental science to support humanity in the process of transforming the planet. So thank you, and uh, Julie. Thank you, Ethne and Joseph, for this timely and incredibly important piece of work. Um, and I think this kind of project really showcases IES's ability to bring together that diverse group of stakeholders. That's what the team has really done over the past year, so thank you. Uh, and, and, con and provide that convening place for discussions, which I'm sure you will, you will carry on. Uh, so the next stage is to deliver that village, vision. If you would like to be part of um, that movement um, and you're not already, please join IES. Uh, and if you're already a member, really encourage you to get involved in our governance. We have um, a range of opportunities from council um, to, to our committees and, and a range of technical panels where your input would be really appreciated and, and valued. So please just grab any of us at, at the drinks, Joseph and Ethne, Adam, myself, and we can talk you through some of those opportunities. So, to tonight's lecture. Uh, so, our proposition for tonight, our global society is addicted to a vision of the world that's become unsustainable and undesirable. Uh, our lecture tonight frames our current predicament, predicament as a societal addiction to a growth at all costs uh, economic paradigm kept in place by the special interests that benefit most from that paradigm. While economic growth has produced many benefits, its side effects are now producing existential problems, as we know, and they're rapidly getting worse. Um, and interestingly, we can learn from what works at the individual level to address key addictions, uh, to design therapies that might work on the societal scale. And I think this raises some really important questions for all of us, because the facts about our predicament, climate um, and environmental disruption, biodiversity loss, growing inequality, financial instability, and at the end of the day, eroding democracy, have been known for decades. Um, and so have the solutions. I think those of us who've been in this field for as long as perhaps I have, and some of you know that the solutions have been on the table for a very long time now. So, why have we not made faster progress? What holds us back? And I'm hoping Professor Constanza will help us answer those questions and blaze a way forward. Um, so, to give you your proper introduction, um, Professor Constanza is Professor of Ecological Economics at the Institute for Global Prosperity at the University College London at UCL uh, and Ambassador for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance 
co-founder and past president of the International Society for Ecological Economics, founding editor of the journal Economics, uh, Ecological Economics, and current editor-in-chief of the Anthropocene Review. Have I said Anthropocene yes, properly? Yes, that's very good. Ex thank you. <laughs> I've always struggled with that. Excellent <laughs> term, but difficult to pronounce sometimes. And your in transdisciplinary research integrates study of humans and the rest of nature to address, the, um, to address research policy and management issues at multiple time and space scales, from small watersheds to the global system. That's a big thing to do. So, as the author of 600 scientific papers and 30 books, including your latest book, which you're going to talk to us about, Addicted to Growth, Societal Therapy for a Sustainable Wellbeing Future, you're very welcome. We look forward to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, you. Very much. <laughs> now, how do I get my slides? Or is there a technical guy? <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't. You just use that. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Is that okay? We'll thank you. Ahead. Thanks very much. <clears throat> and thanks for that kind introduction. And, and thanks for the summary of the, uh, the vision document. I think that uh, that's really exactly what we need to be doing um, <clears throat> to overcome this addiction to, to, uh, to growth. Uh, so, and I'd like to uh, dedicate this talk to Will Stefan and Herman Daly, two of our colleagues who I'm sure many of you know who passed away this last, this last year. Um, and just by way of introduction, too, I'm, I'm not an economist by training, anyway. I, my background is in systems ecology, and I actually took economics as a foreign language as part of my PhD. <laughs> so, uh, because I think it is important uh, to understand how the whole system functions, including the economy, society, and, and the rest of nature. And you all know that we do live now in the Anthropocene epoch. Uh, because of the magnitude of human impact uh, on our, our planet, on our life support system. And I think the, the uh, compelling implication of that is that business as usual is no longer an option. We have to recognize our interdependence uh, with uh, the rest of nature if our goal is really to create a sustainable and desirable Anthropocene. Uh, we may collapse. Civiliz this civilization may collapse like several others have collapsed in the past. Uh, but I think our, our challenge is to, um, to not let that happen, uh, to, to create the sustainable and desirable future. And I think the time is really now uh, to build a different kind of economy and society that's based on a different fundamental goal, you know, the goal of sustainable well-being for humans and the rest of nature. And put it in those terms, that it's not humans and nature, it's humans and the rest of nature. We're all in this, in this on this planet together. Um, <clears throat> so that to create that sustainable well-being future, I think, is going to require uh, the integration of these three elements. Uh, first of all, having an adequate vision, first of all, of how the world works, how the world is, our scientific understanding. And certainly that's what we've all been involved with, in, trying to understand how uh, the environment functions, you know, earth system science, and all of the, all the scientific disciplines that we've been involved with. And we're making a huge amount of progress there, I think, in, in increasing that level of understanding. Uh, but also our understanding of how human psychology works, you know, the whole uh, positive psychology area, you know, the science, the, the uh, psychology of well-being. And putting all of those pieces together, I think, is really the challenge. Uh, <clears throat> not the individual disciplines, which are making significant progress, but putting them all together. But we also need a vision of how we would like the world to be. You know, what is, what is our shared vision uh, for the future? And I'll argue that that's really the essence of the kind of therapy that will that will help to get us out of this uh, predicament. That has to be combined with or integrated with the appropriate tools and analytical techniques. And I think that's going to require much more systems thinking and modeling and analysis, understanding how this whole system functions uh, in an interconnected way. Um, and also, it's going to require some implementation strategies that are uh, you know, some new kinds of institutions that get uh, beyond private institutions and state institutions to more common property institutions that can manage uh, the kinds of systems that we've that we've allowed uh, to to deteriorate over in the uh, in, in the planet. So um, <clears throat> you know, from our increasing scientific understanding, we know that the world is a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system. It has thresholds. It has tipping points. It has surprises. Uh, you know, we we under we're beginning to understand that. Complexity. This is just from one of Tim Lenton's papers on uh, some of the climate tipping points that we that we know about. You know, ice sheets melting are probably the best known one, but there's a whole range 
of different potential tipping points, it, which if passed, you know, can uh, accelerate climate change much more quickly than some of the, some of the uh, uh, predictions are, are showing. Uh, and we know that there are fundamental planetary boundaries. You've probably uh, seen some version of this, of this paper out there about the safe operating space and planetary boundaries and ecological constraints. And there's um, a new version that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, that, that argued that we've already surpassed six of the nine uh, safe operating spaces in, in, uh, for planetary boundaries. Um, obviously, the most, the most well-known one is climate change, but you know, there's, uh, there's uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, biophysical integrity or biodiversity loss you know, novel entities, uh, you know, land, land system change, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're outside the safe operating space for humanity on the planet. And this is one of Will Steffen's recent uh, diagrams showing that, um, you know, in the, in the Holocene, uh, when we developed uh, civilization as we know it, uh, we were in a fairly stable period, uh, climate period, that looked something like uh, just the end of that, that diagram. Um, and in the Anthropocene, we, we've, we uh, started in, in that period, but we've begun to move to what might end up being, you know, a hothouse earth uh, scenario. So how do we make that transition uh, right now into a stabilized earth condition? How do we keep the climate, uh, you know, in a, in a state uh, that, that, we, uh, that we can survive in um, uh, going forward, a sustainable and desirable future? Um, so that's all been known for a long time, but unfortunately, uh, that's not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. Uh, so <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot of um, uh, <laughs> support for the idea that, that nothing's wrong, that we can continue uh, going the way we, we have been going. Uh, but I think that, that that's beginning to change. And I think we, we are now ready uh, for a third movie, uh, which is what we need, a different approach that says not, not that we're headed for disaster, yet, which we may well be, uh, but how, would you, how do we frame this in a more positive, positive way? How do we create a positive vision of a sustainable and desirable economy in society, in the rest of nature? Recognizing that embeddedness, you know, that we're not talking about three separate things. Uh, we're talking about one interconnected system uh, that, that we have to understand and manage in that, in that format. And we, and we need a, a compelling narrative uh, that, that engages uh, the general public that says that that future is possible, that future will be a better future, uh, that future will be one when, <clears throat> where well-being will be more broadly distributed uh, and sustainable, et cetera. So how do we do that? <clears throat> um, this is one idea for you know, the safe and just um, space uh, for humanity from uh, Kate Rayworth's idea of the, the, uh, the donut economy. We have to stay within planetary boundaries, but we also need to create the elements of well-being and quality of life uh, to support uh, people's uh, well-being uh, within, within those boundaries. So that's, that's kind of our challenge, uh, to get into the state, safe and just operating space to, uh, uh, for both. Um, <clears throat> ecological economics uh, has uh, uh, been addressing those sorts of problems uh, for, for decades now. Um, and it's based on these three interdependent or integrated questions or goals, first of all, to that we need to uh, create an ecologically sustainable scale for the economy within the, the uh, uh, ecological life support system. So stay within planetary boundaries, basically. Um, <clears throat> we need a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between the current and future generations, and between humans and other species. And we need an economically efficient allocation of resources that includes everything that contributes uh, to human well-being, not just marketed goods and services, but natural and social capital and everything, uh, everything there. So um, <clears throat> that that idea and several others, I think, have been uh, have been uh, developed uh, recently. The well-being economy, the the uh, uh, donut economy that I just mentioned, the idea of ecological civilization is something popular in China these days. The steady state economy that Herman Daly talked about the circular bioeconomy. So you'll hear several different versions, I think, of very similar kinds of ideas. And there is some convergence and some consensus that's, that I think is building that we need to, to, uh, to work on. So. But let me take a step back and look a bit more at what part of the problem is. 
Uh, and that's this empty world vision of the economy <clears throat> that I think is still driving a lot of our policy uh, going forward, that there's land, labor, and capital. Can I use the, yeah, there we go. Not really. Okay. <clears throat> The primary factors of production, land, labor, and capital. You can see that land is kind of grayed out here because there's the assum an assumption of almost perfect substitutability between these factors. You don't really need land or resources. You just need more capital and labor to produce more uh, marketed goods and services, which is what GDP measures, <clears throat> that are either consumed in the current period uh, or reinvested to build more capital for the, for the next period. And that consumption uh, is, is really the main path to well-being or, wel or welfare. So the more we, can, the more we consume, uh, the better we are, the better off we are. More is always better. And that GDP is a good proxy for this overall uh, so, uh, societal welfare. Um, there's nothing constraining this economy. It can grow forever. You know, that scale uh, is, is not really an issue. Uh, poverty can best be solved with more growth. Uh, and so there's not a real worry about distribution uh, as much as let's just make the pie bigger and then we'll figure out how to split it later. And nature is kind of a sideshow and private property is always best because you're talking about marketed goods and services which are privatizable. Um, <clears throat> so what we need I think is a, a different vision, a different model uh, for how the economy works and, and, uh, and what it's for. Uh, and so we have to recognize that we live in a materially closed Earth system, first of all. Everything has to go somewhere. That These four basic types of assets um, are all required in a more balanced way uh, to produce both conventional goods and services, but also <clears throat> uh, to produce well-being more broadly conceived. Uh, so in addition to conventional built capital, uh, we have you know, human capital, not just labor, uh, but everything about individual people, their, their intelligence, their health. Uh, social capital is all of the um, formal and informal networks among people, you know, our institutions, our cultures, our, our, our governments, our societies, uh, the market itself is a form of social capital. And finally, natural capital, everything else in the world that we didn't have to produce, you know, the, the environment essentially. And that um, our well-being is a much more complex function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are. Uh, and I think we all, we all know that, um, and there's been lots of evidence uh, supporting that more recently, as I said, with the, in the fields of positive psychology and um, this idea of, of surveying uh, subjective well-being. Uh, there's been global surveys where they go around and ask people, you know, on a scale of one to ten, uh, how satisfied are you with your life overall? And they find, <clears throat> you know, um, answers that that range across a whole spectrum. Uh, but that's something that you can use to compare how people are doing in different countries and different parts parts of the country. Uh, but that depends on meeting this um, basic set of human needs, which go far beyond uh, just subsistence and reproduction to security and affection. There have been several uh, lists like this, going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and more recently Manfred McNeef and Barbara Nussbaum and, and others. Uh, so, so we know that those, those needs are, are quite, uh, quite more complicated. Um, how we weight uh, the... the uh, uh, meeting those needs and how we feel subjective well-being varies by personality, by culture, et cetera. Uh, but what we can do from a policy point of view is create the, the opportunities for people to meet those needs, to feel that sense of subjective well-being by wh how we arrange our, our assets, our built, our human, our social, and our natural capital. And so our goals really um, have to do with something around this idea of well-being or quality of life or uh, one health or ecosystem health or inclusive prosperity or flourishing. There's been a lot of uh, different terms, I think, that have been used to describe just what, we're, just what we're after. But I think they're all circling around the same, the same sort of ideas. How do we get this overall uh, conception of, of, uh, of well-being that applies at multiple scales from individuals all the way up to the, uh, to the planet uh, that has to do with how well it's function things are functioning? One of the major inputs, I think, uh, to that well-being at the uh, in both at the individual and the societal scale is this idea of ecosystem services, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, good, it's good to hear. Um, which are, the, you know, the benefits that people derive from these functioning ecosystems, not just cutting them down and using wood uh, or or harvesting fish, 
uh, which are some of the provisioning services, but, but some more, more important ones like regu uh, regulatory services, regulating the climate, uh, you know, uh, flood protection, et cetera. Uh, this is from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment from several years ago, which showed the connections between those, those uh, uh, services and all the constituents of human well-being that, I, that I've just been mentioning. Um, one thing they left out, I think, of this diagram was the interaction with the other forms of capital. Uh, that in fact, you require, we require this interaction between natural, built, human, and social capital uh, to produce sustainable well-being. And this is an inherently transdisciplinary uh, sort of research area. How do these assets inter interact with each other to produce sustainable well-being in different contexts uh, with, different, with different populations, et cetera? It's not that natural capital just flows directly to well-being. Um, it's... It's a more complicated uh, system than that. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the policy community with ecosystem services. There's the IPEES, which you probably heard something about, sort of the IPCC equivalent for ecosystem services. Uh, there's the Ecosystem Services Partnership, uh, which is a global uh, academic and practitioner uh, group as regular meetings. There's one coming up in, in Chile next week, actually. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in who's doing what, in this area, take a look at their, their website. Uh, interest in the academic community of, on ecosystem services has been growing exponentially. <clears throat> this is from Scopus, just the number of articles published on the topic, ecosystem services by year, it's now up to almost 50,000 uh, articles. So if you wanna do a literature review, it's gonna take, take some time. Um, that's why I think we need some AI tools to help us do that, but uh, anyway, the most Highly cited of those articles so far is this one that we published back in 1997 that you may have seen, where we tried to estimate uh, the, the value of 17 different ecosystem services across 16 different biomes and uh, estimate with a capital E, because our, we acknowledge the uh, uncertainty in the fact that this is almost, cert almost certainly a, a, a severe underestimate, but still it was uh, significantly larger than global GDP at the time. And I think that's that's a significant point in, in its own, that these ecosystem services and benefits that we hadn't been paying very much attention to are actually uh, a major component in, in our sustainable well-being. <clears throat> that kicked off, I think, a lot of um, additional research in those 50,000 papers that I just mentioned uh, were part of the, the, uh, what happened afterwards. Um, we were really fortunate to get the cover of the magazine that, that year, but... Uh, we didn't control exactly what they put on the cover. They said pricing the planet. And we really didn't mean pricing as much as valuing <coughs> the planet uh, for reasons that some of you will understand. <laughs> and, uh, and I think there are a lot of still misconceptions about um, ecosystem services and valuation. And we have to recognize that you know, economics is not the market. The market is just one institution that we use for allocation res allocating resources that this valuation is not the same thing as privatization or commodification or trading. Uh, we're talking about largely public goods uh, that we don't necessarily want to, want to trade, but we do want to have some idea of their relative value uh, so that we can make better decisions about them. And expressing these values in monetary units, not the only units we could express them in. There could be a whole range of different types of units, but uh, being able to compare them with other things um, is, is really important but they're not the same thing as market or exchange values. Again, back to the, to the second thing there. And I think uh, there's also a confusion with intrinsic values and these um, <clears throat> sort of monetary unit values. That intrinsic values really, I think, are more about rights uh, than they are about valuation. That these, these systems have the right to exist. There's the whole idea of the, uh, you know, the personhood of the Wanganui River uh, kind, of, kind of approach. Uh, but I think that's, <clears throat> they're not, these are not inconsistent ideas, but it's, uh, I think the term value uh, gets used <clears throat> or has led to some confusion when you're really talking about rights. And also, I don't think we can avoid this valuation. We can't just say we won't, don't want to do that because every time we make a decision about ecosystems, there's an implicit valuation of what's, what's better and what's worse. Uh, so <clears throat> um, we're, what we're really talking about is in increasing the transparency of that uh, decision-making process, and un uncovering, I think, some of the uncertainty that's, that's always going to be there. So um, 
since that paper, one of the criticisms we got, one of the many criticisms we got on that paper was that, oh, this is just a one-off one you know, shot, and it doesn't really mean anything because what do you compare it with? And so one of the things we did was to say, well, how has that changed? Using the same sort of methods, uh, in this case, uh, from 1997 to 2011, and we found that because of, largely because of land use change, because of deforestation, desertification, loss of coral reefs, uh, you know, we've lost from four to twenty trillion dollars a year in the value of these ecosystem services going forward. We've also done some projections into the future <clears throat> uh, to see what sort of policies would be needed to really recover uh, some of that value. And certainly, the the conventional market forces approach, uh, business as usual, would continue the degradation in the, at the same rate. Uh, but we could um, uh, sort of stop the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, could, we could level things off with the appropriate sets of policies, but we could also make a great transition and try to, re, uh, to rebuild and restore many of these ecosystems and recover uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the value and the support that they had. So that's the natural capital component. I think the social capital component is equally, if not more important, uh, to our sustainable well-being. And that uh, at, that partly comes down to the distribution of wealth and resources and inequality that, that has been uh, increasing in many countries recently. Uh, and we know from this, this sort of relationship that uh, Richard, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett published in the spirit level not too long ago, that there's a strong relationship between income inequality and a whole range of social problems. Um, and I think there's been a lot more work along these lines since, since then as well. Uh, so we know that we need to reduce uh, inequality going forward in order to, to have this fairness goal that I talked about <clears throat> uh, better, better established. Um, and we know that um, you know, our main measure of societal well-being, GDP, uh, in this case GDP per capita, uh, when you plot it against things like life satisfaction, uh, you get these kinds of diminishing returns kind of curve. And we know that there are a lot of problems with using GDP as a measure of of societal well-being. Uh, it counts everything as positive. Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, <laughs> let, me go, let me go down the list here. <laughs> um, it was, first of all, never designed as a measure of societal well-being. In fact, Simon Kuznets, uh, who was one of the main architects of, of GDP, said, you know, you should not use it as a measure of well-being and calls for more growth should specify of what and for what. Uh, you know, if there's more crime, for example, uh, GDP um, registers that as a positive thing. Uh, so it's, uh, if there's more uh, pollution, uh, GDP can register that as a positive thing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, need some, we need to revise that, um, that measure. Uh, and it was, um, it was only created, really, or, or instituted uh, internationally at the Brenton Woods Conference in 1944. So it's not that, not that old of a, of, a, uh, of a measure, even though people tend to think of it as something that's you know, a force of nature. Uh, it's really quite recent, and, um, and, it, and it needs to be changed. So, <clears throat> um, and, we, and yet, uh, many of our policies you know, are sort of aimed at increasing GDP growth at, at all costs. Um, and yet, it's having all of these negative, uh, negative effects. So it's, it's well past time, I think, to leave GDP behind as our measure of, of societal well-being. And there have been a whole range of alternatives that have been proposed. Um, in that paper I just mentioned, uh, we just pointed out a few of them. Uh, there are several that were based on trying to modify GDP, like the Genuine Progress Indicator. I'll say a little bit more about that one. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of them that are attempts to, to uh, survey uh, well-being directly, using life satisfaction kind of surveys. And there's a whole set that are uh, based on indices of multiple things that, that you put together into an index, like the Human Development Index or the, um, the OECD Better, Better Life Index is one of the more recent ones. Um, <clears throat> we had a class at UCL uh, recently uh, go out and try to collect all of the alternative indicators that have been proposed. And they came up with, uh, so far, 375 alternative indicators. So this has been something, you know, a real cottage industry. Uh, these days, which just shows the, the interest in doing something different. Uh, but, but on the other hand, it's probably part of the problem uh, because I think there are so many different alternatives 
what do people what do people use? So I think it's really time now to to build this broader consensus about what do we mean by well-being and how do we go about measuring it. Um, one alternative that I'll just mention quickly uh, is the genuine progress indicator, which is something that modifies GDP or starts with GDP or a component of GDP, personal consumption expenditures. So it says that's that's a good thing, but you have to weight that by income distribution. So if uh, you know, a dollar's worth of income to a, a poor person is worth more in terms of welfare than a dollar's worth of income to a, to a rich person. So if you're talking about welfare instead of income, you've got to worry about how it's distributed. And we talked about the influence of income inequality before. Um, it adds a few things that are left out of GDP, like the value of household labor and the value of volunteer work. Obviously good things, but are not marketed. And then it subtracts a bunch of things that should not be counted as positive, even though they are in GDP, like um, the cost of commuting, you know, the cost of crime, uh, the cost of air and water pollution, et cetera, the loss of wetlands, cost of climate change, et cetera. When you do that, you get results that look something like this, where GDP per capita globally in this case has been going up, uh, you know, over time back to the 50s. Uh, but after about 1980 or so, uh, we've moved from a period of economic growth to a period of uneconomic growth. The economy is growing, but it's not really economic in the sense of improving uh, genuine progress or, or well-being. So <clears throat> that and many other uh, indicators, I think, have, be have begun to show uh, that we're, you know, uh, uh, we're using the wrong kinds of indicators. And in fact, you might say that we are, uh, in a sense, addicted to this growth in GDP because we're, we're, uh, we're continuing down that path, even though we know uh, that it's leading to a situation that's not improving our well-being. So <clears throat> how do we break out of this addiction to the growth at all cost paradigm, uh, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption in high income countries? And I keep, think a key step in that therapy is building this shared vision of what a sustainable and desirable future uh, looks like. What does it focus on? So we did some work uh, with psychologists <clears throat> and asked, asked that question. Well. You want to overcome addictions, you know, what, what is a good therapy? What, what does work at the individual scale? And uh, one of the ones that they said was the most effective uh, was this one called motivational interviewing. Has anybody heard of this before? Any psychologists in the room? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't either at the time, but <laughs> I found it really interesting. And what it does, instead of confronting addicts, you know, with the problem, which often leads to denial and, you know, um, uh, uh, which is exactly what we have been doing, you know, with society in general. Uh, we've been uh, getting better and better at, uh, at enumerating what the problems are. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, that, that doesn't seem to be quite as effective as, uh, as engaging the addicts in a positive discussion of what their goals and motives uh, and their, what their future uh, could look like. So focus on uh, creating a vision of the, the kind of a future that the individual wants, and then use that to motivate uh, the, the difficult changes that are often required to, to break out of the pattern, of the, the habits uh, you know, that, that, uh, that we all fall into. Uh, so it seems to work at the individual scale. <clears throat> um, so the obvious analogy, I guess, at the uh, societal scale is how do we build that shared vision? Uh, how, do we, how do we use that to help motivate uh, these kinds of policies that we all know uh, are, are what we need to do uh, right now. Um, the SDGs, I think, are a, a significant step in the right direction there. Uh, so, you know, they are the first time in human history, really, when all countries in the world have come together and said, these are our shared goals, you know, at least at the policy level. Um, <clears throat> how they're being implemented, uh, I think, is another question. And I think the uh, uh, the recognition in the general population of the SDGs, I think, is another is another question. I'm not sure, you know, what fraction of even of the UK population has even heard of the SDGs. Would you estimate? And I'm guessing it's it's not a very large fraction. <clears throat> so we haven't been doing a very good job of getting this information out uh, to the general public and getting that discussion going and building a, tr a truly shared vision. Uh, <clears throat> so. Let's see. And also um, understanding you know, the interactions among those 17 goals. They're not independent from each other. Uh, there are synergies and trade-offs among them. They all contribute to these 
uh, sub goals of sustainable scale, fair distribution, and efficient allocation in different ways, in different contexts, and to the overarching goal of a sustainable well-being future. So understanding those, those connections, I think, and being able to model that system, I think, is a, is a challenge going forward. But I think the main one is how to create this shared vision. Um, one way is to create more compelling narratives about what that future could look like. Uh, so we asked 45 global thought leaders in this, in this book uh, to, to uh, try and do that, describe what, what that better future, what that sustainable future would look like, <clears throat> and got some really interesting results there. Uh, there's also the process of scenario planning, which you've probably all been involved with in some, in some sense or another. Uh, this is from the Great Transition Initiative uh, scenarios. They've uh, outlined these four basic archetypical scenarios, I think, uh, for, for quite a while. The sort of conventional market forces business as usual, the policy reform scenario, uh, the fortress world collapse scenario, and the Great Transition scenario, uh, which is more based on on well-being at the, at the community scale, and I think is fairly consistent with uh, the SDG future uh, going forward. Um, so how do we get that, um, those alternatives um, out uh, to a larger population? Um, and I think that's going to take uh, more than just scientific reports. Uh, it's going to take you know, input from the arts community. Uh, we've been talking with people about doing some short videos. You know, what would these alternative futures look like? and which ones of them are preferable uh, to you and why? And how can we get that discussion going and start to build that consensus? Uh, we did some um, public opinion surveys in Australia uh, around these four alternative futures. You know, we had asked people to read about them <clears throat> and, then, and think about them and say which ones that they, uh, that they prefer. We changed the names a bit, but they're essentially the same as the great transition scenarios. Um, and we found that the vast majority, 72% ranked the community well-being scenario you know, as being either the first or the second preference. Um, and yet, at the same time, they thought that the free enterprise scenario was the one that the country was headed towards. So there's, there's this conflict between <clears throat> where people want to go, I think, and where people think the country, uh, country or the system is going. Um, and I think that needs to be brought, brought forward into the discussion um, more effectively. <clears throat> and then I think we also need to build uh, the broader coalition uh, that's necessary to move this, this, these ideas forward. And I think uh, some of you may have heard of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Has anybody heard of this group yet? <clears throat> Just one person. <laughs> Two people. I told you. <laughs> uh, which is trying to bring together all of the different institutions and individuals and groups uh, that are working along these lines because I think we need to build, you know, uh, a critical mass, and that that uh, that's a, across the whole range, you know, not just of the environmental movement, but the social justice movement and and all of the other groups that are that are aiming towards this sustainable, well-being kind of future. Uh, there's a group of governments that had committed to that, including Scotland, Iceland, Wales, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and Finland, I think. There's a good TED talk by um, Nicholas Sturgeon uh, about this well-being economy government movement. So can we get um, governments to begin to take uh, to shift their goals away from GDP growth you know, by itself towards this broader conception of, of well-being? Uh, and I, I uh, <clears throat> invite you all to take a look at uh, the, the Well-Being Economy Alliance and, uh, and, and coordinate with them. And I'm not sure if IES would like to become a a member, if they're not already, they may already be, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should be a member of this alliance going forward. Uh, there's also the, um, uh, the Club of Rome, which has been doing some significant work recently. Uh, this is the 50th, actually the 51st anniversary now of the publication of the Limits to Growth. And in honor of that uh, 50th anniversary, uh, they did this, this work called Earth for All, uh, which looks at a couple of major scenarios and, and builds a new computer, a global computer model to sort of back up uh, those, those scenarios going forward. Um, and there's been also some work on uh, managing without growth uh, and prosperity without growth. You've probably heard of Tim Jackson's work and, uh, and Peter Victor uh, and also Andrew Sims' book, We Cancel the, the Apocalypse. And, and these are asking the question, well, can we have an economy that's not growing? Will that actually work? 
and uh, Peter uh, Victor created a, a computer model of the Canadian economy and asked that question. And he said, well, yeah, if you just shut off GDP, then you'll have a disaster. But with the right set of policies, policy reforms, you could have a better low grow growth, positive economy that, that satisfies all of the criteria that we've been talking about uh, without, uh, without GDP growth. How do you do that? Uh, well, here's a set of policies. This is like, this is like the 12-step program uh, for overcoming the addiction. Uh, and first is you need new meanings and measures of success. So you need to go beyond GDP and towards uh, GPI or something more elaborate uh, that looks at how, how you're actually doing in, in uh, creating uh, sustainable well-being. You need limits on materials, energy, waste, and land use. So stay within planetary boundaries. <clears throat> You need more meaningful prices. We know that the market is not telling us the truth about anything that we buy uh, because of all the external costs that are, that are, uh, that are not incorporated into the, into the prices. So we need to, uh, to do that. We need more durable and repairable products. Uh, we don't need to build you know, for obsolescence. Uh, we need the circular economy, essentially. Uh, we need to, to, uh, to recycle everything. We need fewer status goods. Uh, so our consumption should be for real need, not, not for mere, merely building status. And I think a lot of consumption these days, especially at the high end, is simply for, uh, for status and not for need. Uh, we need more informative advertising. <clears throat> a lot of advertising these days is to make us unhappy and to think that we can only be happy if we buy the product and, and, and use it for status purposes. Uh, so we need advertising to be limited to, to just telling us what the product does and and, uh, and, and not why, why we need it to be happy. Uh, we need better screening of technology. I think this is really a critical one, uh, especially now with, with uh, AI technology coming in. You know, we need technology that, like, technology is a good servant, but a poor master. You know, we don't wanna just follow where technology leads. We wanna say, what are our goals? What kind of world are we trying to create? And how do we create the technology that will help us get there, not the other way around? <clears throat> We need more efficient capital stock uh, for the same reasons <clears throat> as part of the circular economy. Uh, we need more local and less global, and not just to reduce transport costs, uh, but because local economies uh, create social capital, create more, uh, more significant well-being at the, at the local level. Um, and also you know, disrupting that, those sorts of um, communities uh, can have a real damaging effect on, on well-being. Uh, so <clears throat> it's not all about uh, you know, the, the minimum price uh, for goods and services. It's really looking at uh, the overall well-being of the community. And once you do that, I think you're going to come to this conclusion. Reduced inequality, um, we obviously need that. I've talked about that, I think, uh, enough, why we need that. Um, less work and more leisure. Anybody opposed to this one? No. Be hard, this would be easy to get across. But it, it's really about the work-life balance. How do we share the work more equitably? Uh, how, you know, we don't want half the people overworked and half the people you know, sort of unemployed. Uh, so how do we do a better job of, of distributing work uh, and, uh, and leisure? And finally, education for life and not just work. So our education system should not be about just training people how to you know, get a job to make money to buy things that they really don't need. Uh, but, but how to understand what actually contributes to their well-being and to society's well-being and to help uh, build that, that well-being more broadly. So I think I'm at the end here, and I'll just put in a plug at the end for uh, the book that I'm mainly drawing on, but also a couple of other ones that just came out. Uh, we have a, a collection of essays on forward and integrated science of well-being, uh, looking at um, <clears throat> well-being at the individual, the community, and, and the uh, and the the national and the global scale, and what they all have in common and how, they, how they're interrelated, and, uh, and also a research and action agenda for ecological economics going forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we can all sign up to your 
your prescription. I think the interesting conversation is how we how are we going to get there. Yeah. Uh, can I also welcome our two uh, respondents to the stage, um, Dimitri and Mark. Thank you to join us. Um, are we are we okay without specific mics? Um, we are okay. Brilliant. I, I understand uh, there are very good mics. If the two of you would like to take a seat. Um, I'll just, just give you both a quick introduction, if that's, if that's all right. Uh, Dr. Mark Everard is an author, scientist and broadcaster with extensive involvement in the worlds of environment and sustainability and also angling and music, which I assume you are. And we're also very pleased to say you're one of our IEF Vice Presidents, so yeah. welcome. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can't see that one. Uh, <laughs> and Dimitri Sangelis, welcome Dimitri. Uh, is special advisor to the Wealth Economy Project at the Bennett uh, Institute, University of Cambridge, senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics, which is um, where, where I uh, learnt a lot about history, but not a lot about economics, um, and previous roles uh, at the Grantham Institute, lead author on the Stern Review, which I'm sure is going to be very relevant for this conversation, um, and head of economic broadcasting at the Treasury, and we're all really interested in how, how that went. Um, <laughs> well, well, how? Um, so I get, I'm going to begin. As I say, the point of having respondents is we have two people who can give, I think, very experienced and interesting reflections on your, your lectures over time. If, if, I, if I may. So, um, Mark, do you want to start? I, I think maybe just start by saying, um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, these concepts are familiar to those of us who've had a little bit of background in ecological economics. But what did you hear tonight that makes you think, yes, there's a a step we're about to take forward. Well, I'm just sort of reflecting back. The paradigm shift we need is in the way the UK is, is getting very enthusiastic about nature-based markets. We've always had nature-based markets. It's just we've trashed nature <laughs> to do the market. So intensive farming, intensive fishing. And, and I'm doing work with DEFRA and with BSI, with, with other bodies. So I'd say actually nature-based markets means nature's at the middle. Nature has to regenerate and produce the services from which we obtain the multiple values that we want. So we don't just trash the field for food. We think about the, the soil and, and retaining the soil and the carbon and the nutrient dynamics and the biodiversity. Nature is inherently systemic, but the market that we've created, that we've all grown up in, um, is essentially exploitative. Um, so it's in that, in that very term, nature-based market, this is a turning point that we really need to um, put it on its head with systemic outcomes like the SDGs um, and, and to sort of subvert the old addiction to maximum profit, short-term benefit to investor, we're okay, our kids aren't, sort of world that we live in. We can do it. Um, I mean, Bob and I traded books uh, last year. I, I got addicted to growth when Bob got my Rebuilding the Earth, which actually collates examples from the developed, the developing world, rural, urban, massive landscape scale and a tiny little local scale, where we're doing this for flood, for food, for, for so many things. We can do it. The challenge is to break addiction, to turn it into the mainstream. And one of Bob's papers that I, I use a lot in teaching, actually, um, with Bill Mitch, I think it was, after Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in Hurricane Katrina, the you know, um, New Orleans went underwater. If you ever went there, you could see the big boats going by, so like up there, and you knew bad things were going to happen. But essentially, the Mississippi is levied, so the sediment wasn't coming to, to regenerate the land. The land was drained anyway and, and was sinking. And by the way, the delta was depleting. So when Katrina hit, the ecosystem service of storm abatement was there. I mean, I like your paper very much because it says the only rational way to deal with New Orleans is to regenerate the delta for flood resilience, for carbon, for nutrients, for fishery, regeneration, for biodiversity, for nutrient cycling, for carbon. So the US, I think, decided to build bigger walls, didn't they, in the end? <laughs> We spoke in Montpellier about that one. Um, even though it's... They, 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 they are destructive. Well, we could. 
Because, I mean, one of your key points is it's actually economically rational to do yeah. the sensible thing. And still we didn't. Yeah. <coughs> because our addictions are um, so widely sort of fragmented across departmental interests, policy areas, you know, consultancy expertise, and so, and so forth. So the leverage we need to break the addiction is, is to think of that big picture in which everyone wins rather than the narrow fractions win. Um, and I had this conversation with Gideon Henderson, you know, Death the Chief Scientist, today. He asked me to come in and talk to him because I chewed his ear off last time we got together. Um, so certainly people in government are thinking like this, but we just need an absolute push. And that's, it's on all of us, this. You know, this is a turning point in history of, of, of breaking that addiction and putting ecosystem regeneration and multi-service outcomes and the SDGs or whatever comes next as the things we measure as outcomes, not just a short-term buck. I'll, I'll shut up here because I could go on forever. So you, so you do think that idea is taking hold in government? And the question would be, and I'm sure Dimitri will comment on this, which parts of government you know, may be understood in the scientific part of the Department for Environment, but whether it's understood throughout government would be my question. But Dimitri, I'm going to, I'm going to let you give your, your reflections as well, you know, what struck you, what, what takes us forward. Well, thanks for a fascinating and thoughtful talk. You, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I agree with almost everything you say. I'm going to tell you, you know, perhaps frame that through the activities I've been involved in, uh, which I, I hope will and then I'll end by saying something which probably or perhaps won't meet with your approval, um, but you know, discuss it in a provocative so <laughs> for the audience if I did. And, and that can be summarized as saying I pretty much accept everything you're saying, except the stuff about growth. Um, so let me say what I mean about that. So the World Economy Project, um, it sounds like it's some sort of private Swiss banking outfit. It's actually the full title is Wealth Economy on Natural and Social Capital. Its starting point is that there are many shortcomings of GDP. It doesn't measure well-being, it doesn't measure happiness. But a critical uh, shortcoming in a world where you care about sustainability is it's a flow measure. Um, you can absolutely trash the planet, but so long as next week's or next month's or next quarter's um, you know, flow of goods and services is rising, you're okay. You, you don't even look at what's happening in the rest of the planet because we really don't have measures of the stock of assets that generate future growth. And the lovely thing about wealth is it's only valuable insofar as it generates a, a stream of future well-being. So if you're not monitoring your wealth, I mean, you wouldn't have a, you know, no family operates without looking at its, uh, you know, mortgage and debt and savings, and, and no business does. It's extraordinary that, you know, society does at the economic level. Um, and so the next thing you, you notice, of course, is that most um, measures of wealth, to the extent that we have them, are going up. Physical, produced wealth, human capital, um, uh, technology, uh, intangible capital, with one glaring exception, natural capital. It's the only one that's absolutely going down. Um, critical parts of that are, are renewable. Social, social capital. And social capital is, is a, bit, a bit, you're right, it's a question. Inequality going up. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So, but natural capital is very clearly going and natural capital can't be substituted with, you know, more buildings and more flyovers and more trains. Whereas, you know, there's other bits of capital you can substitute. So it's not measuring like for like, in particular, renewable natural capital, which if it meets certain thresholds, and many of them are, uh, just won't renew. And they will, they will um, irreversibly deplete. And then you've lost services, ecosystem services, that you would have had infinitely till eternity. Uh, plus, if you have the interaction with other capitals, I mean, it's great to have the best factories, infrastructure, an educated workforce, but if you're constantly facing drought or floods or heat waves and your biodiversity is, you know, being destroyed and your ecosystems being completely degraded, um, you won't survive for very long. These are existential issues. So that's one area I work. And the other is um, the question of what we can do about it, where economists, I will often say, not only get the future wrong, they make the future wrong. Why? And you'll probably like the bigoted economists, and I think we, we play a big part in having caused a big part of this problem. Because we constantly tell people that it's impossible to make the change. It's eye-wateringly expensive to live in a renewable world with you know, a circular economy and all the rest of it. And the problem is that one of the things that actually drives cost reductions in renewables and circularity and so on is learning by doing, trying it out, um, economies of scale, 
gigafactories and plants for batteries. Um, and as the costs come down because of these um, economies of scale and learning by doing, you're more inclined to deploy them. So you've got this path dependency, you've got the system dynamic, which economic models can't cope with because they rely on a unique equilibrium, and you've, because you've got this reinforcing feedback, and reinforcing feedbacks are inherently unstable. That's what a, you know, put a microphone next to a speaker and see what happens. And yet that's the nature of the world. So both in terms of the environmental problem, we've got these tipping points that could be catastrophic, but actually in terms of doing something about it, we've got these tipping points that we can design if we induce the innovation that can help us uh, bring the, the requisite change. That innovation will not happen in a vacuum. It has to be stiff. So that's the bit you'll, you'll, you'll probably agree with. The bit you might not disagree with, I think this focus on growth is an absolute distraction and it's potentially really dangerous. It's one of the few things that let me sort of caricature the kind of, you know, free market right and the environmental left agree on. The free market right say you can't save the planet, you can't improve social habit, you, you, certainly you can't save the planet because people will lose their jobs and it's too expensive and ordinary people can't afford um, the new tech. Um, so, it's, so we'll just have to trash the environment. The left will say actually you can't save the environment and, unless you stop growth. Um, so let's stop growth. Now if we really couldn't induce innovation to get more out of the resources we have and, and reduce pollution, I'd say fine, we just have to go for growth. But it's not growth that's the problem, it's material growth and growth that's based on pollution. In fact, if you live within one planet a day, this notion that, that growth is subject to environmental limits is completely wrong. It's not, you know, people invert the second law of thermodynamics. In fact, all you would get if you lived in one, you know, within one planet a day is more growth. Why? Because ideas um, are not, they don't diminish, they don't deplete. Um, they build on each other. So all you do is you learn to use the limited finite set of resources better and better and better. That's what humans do. They're given uh, a chance to do it. Why have we trashed the environment? Well, why wouldn't you if you're not given any reason not to? Somebody's going to make money out of trashing the environment. So your 12-point plan is brilliant. It's a brilliant plan for growth. Um, now, you'd need some adjustments. The right kind of. The right, right. But it would come in GDP, you see, because if you, if you bring within the production boundary, um, you know, uh, planting forests, right, it is the problem. So if you ban cutting forests and you ban pollution and you ban uh, activities that are degrading the environment, you create jobs in renewables, in the circular economy, in planting trees, in safeguarding forests, in digitally monitoring the environment, and so on, which create work and create incomes. If they create work and they create incomes, they come into GDP. So what's in GDP is partly our choice. The reason for all these terrible things in GDP that use so much material resources is because that's how we've decided to live. We've designed it that way. So it really is this notion that people, and we're making the same point, we're basically saying, this notion that living in a cleaner, quieter, more secure, environmentally safe world that is both more efficient and innovative and more productive is a bad thing to do, which is what you know, people will tell you when they rile against growth or they rile against saving the environment, it's the same thing. It's just ludicrous. It's, 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 it will be a better uh, place to live and it will be reflected in the key measures that count. The important thing, though, is you safeguard those primary assets that allow you to generate that stream uh, a, indefinitely into the future, and that means preserving social and natural capital. I'll stop because I've rambled, but we can no, talk about social like, capital I mean, in a minute, because I think it's critically important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, one thing I was going to say about, you didn't use the term decoupling. Yeah. Okay, so part of the discussion about what's wrong with our economic yeah. paradigm, and by the way, I'm not sure it's economists so much as the type of economics mm. that somehow is still Absolutely persistently right. espoused, Absolutely. which is staggering to me, given the Club of Rome was how many decades ago. Mm -hmm. We know we know about it's you know not internalizing the cost the yeah. environmental cost of economics, but nonetheless we seem to cling to it. But the, the decoupling concept seemed to me to express something about yes, things can grow, as Dimitri says, well being can grow just with less material resource, thus with less environmental impact. I mean is that is if that we actually, wanted to, won't happen on its own.
to separate it. Uh, but um, you know, I think that the, the problem is really the material growth in material consumption, you know, and fossil fuels and, and impact on the, on the climate, etc. Uh, so, and, and GDP does uh, does largely track you know that material consumption. Now, if you want to change GDP. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Do something yeah. different. <laughs> Measure something different. Mm -hmm. That's not GDP. That's that's a more comprehensive kind of measure of, of well-being, right? Uh, you can keep the parts, you can keep the parts of GDP that are that are good, and you can modify the parts. And there is ongoing discussion. I mean, there is there is uh, you know, GDP does get tweaked, but it really only gets tweaked. Uh, I think you need some massive changes, and I think there is a, a, a growing movement. Uh, you know, beyond GDP, I was at a conference at the, uh, at the European Union not too long ago, uh, where at least some of the, you know, some of the, the ministers were there saying, "Yeah, we can't, we can't continue to base everything on GDP growth. We've got to have something better as a, as a measure." And we have a project funded by the, uh, by the European Union, a Horizon 2020 project that's aimed at just that. You know, what are better measures of, of well-being going forward? That might include, you know, many elements of GDP, but not. I think one, one thing that concerns me here, is, you know, we all know that um, countries, politicians cling to GDP as a measure of something important, but surely most of us don't listen to the GDP figure and feel inherently Not our GDP, that's the quote. Well, well, it's exactly, not my GDP. Exactly, it's not mine. I don't hear the figure and think particularly one thing or another, other than it's probably an inadequate measure of how, of how my life is. So isn't the more important thing your vision It's not wired for the long term in a funny way. We're not even wired for the good news. I feel we we don't you know we, you know we we're not you know we somehow one, one of my friends said perhaps we're just not evolved enough because we yeah. can't see forward to that bright future where everything's different. So what do we what do we do about that? Do well, think? maybe, but I think also we do we do plan you know and design and I think that's in our in our nature as well. You know, so we we can see ahead. I think that's partly why we've been so successful. You know, you, you can't build a skyscraper without you know <laughs> having a long term plan. Uh, so so I think it is something that we that we certainly can do, um, but we're probably not doing enough of it. Uh, and we care about our kids, and that yeah. doesn't that doesn't bring a return within a political life. You know, within a political five year period, we still right. do it because as a society, we know that living in a world where our kids aren't educated. It's not a world we want to live in. Uh, so we pay taxes for something that will, you know, reap a return in 20 years. Let me, go, let me go back to one of the GDP points, though. Because GDP is based on the system of national accounts, which is a model of the economy. That's a linear input-output model, essentially. You know, it doesn't really have, uh, it, it doesn't look into the future, really. It, it barely looks into the past. And so I think to, to actually get beyond that, we need a, a better model of, of the economy embedded in society and the rest of nature that keeps track of stocks and flows yes. over time and that's what this systems dynamics model like is uh, like the birth for all uh, you know book in, in, uh, includes another uh, is about so we need you know that sort of and, I, and i've heard that um, i think it's indonesia has, or uh, maybe the philippines has actually started to bring that into their, their political decision making more of a systems dynamics model, because that will allow you to look into the future as well. You can make projections into the future and say how stocks and flows are going to change under different policies. And then you can actually address the issue of sustainability and the long term of things. And part of the short termness is that GDP doesn't really look at the future, it just looks at what's happening you know, last year essentially. And it's to get into the future, looking. it's going to yeah. take a different, a different sort of yeah. conception. Okay, that's, yeah, that, that, yeah. One of the, I'm going to open up to the audience in a minute, but just briefly. Yeah, I mean, one of the other addictions, I think, is, is the addiction we've got to forecast rather than back. <laughs> and the power, to me, of the SDGs and, and many other systems frameworks is that you can backcast from them. You can say, what's, what is the desirable future? Whether we can see it tomorrow or not, and then you innovate towards it. We are stuck in a world where we say, well, we do power this way, we do transport this way. <coughs> How can we? I remember working with one company, sort of the company 
invested in energy reduction in its, in its cadmium plating plant. It didn't say, do we need cadmium in the future? So it locked itself into a return on investment to do the wrong thing. And, and we do this. It's, it's a societal habit in, in agriculture, in, in engineering, in transport, pretty much across society. So that is another big mental paradigm shift to say what is the desirable future. Forget whether we can deliver it today, but what steps can we take that are going to lead us onwards? And, and it's a completely different mindset and pathway towards the future that is desirable and equitable. Right, and that's the motivational interview and completely kind of right. approach. Decide on where you want, what you want first and reach that. And, if you, and, and the motivational part is, I mean, you're absolutely right. And that change, I mean, the path of least resistance is no change. People carry on doing things the way they've always done them. Even if they know there's a better future, inertia will always tend to dominate, unless you're given a very strong reason. And that reason usually does have to be couched in terms of self-interest and opportunity rather than moral suasion. Because moral suasion usually breeds a race to the bottom. Everybody waits for everybody else to save the planet and take on the cost. But actually, when you see how much better life could be, Yes. In that yeah. kind of, yeah. you, will, yeah. you, you know, you yes. present a positive vision Absolutely. that generates the kinds of behavior that then becomes self-fulfilling because people find that they do get more innovative and costs do come down and actually prefer living this way. And maybe not having your children die, you know, particular right. suffering from particular pollution is quite a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we and living in a green city. Okay. Okay. But, but how do you show people that what that world would be like? I think that's the challenge, and I think that's mm -hmm. might be where we need. The arts community and filmmakers and say the majority, the vast majority of films about the yep. near term future are dystopic, not, yeah, yeah. not utopic. And don't talk about degrowth. That so, won't generate yes. the right I don't, I don't like that term. So given your film cartoon, it's the, the reassuring truth we're after, not the inconvenient mm -hmm. truth or the reassuring lie. I mean, it's got to be, it's got, okay. this isn't a giant Ponzi scheme, yeah. it's got to be true, it's got to work, right? Yes, yeah. we have to have, okay, thank you all. I'm going to open it up to the audience, so I'm sure I'll have questions for all of you. Um, so let's start with Ian. Um, thank, thank you, Ian Brown. Um, I've heard a lot about growth tonight. I've not heard the phrase population growth mentioned once. And your question... I think in a, in a sustainable well-being future population has to stabilize. So at what level, I guess, is the question. And, and uh, I don't think it would be uh, extreme. How, how do you encourage it then? Sorry? How do you encourage it to stabilize, like everything else? I, I think, if, I think there are some fairly straightforward yeah, yeah. policies that, that could uh, stabilize populations without, without much... Uh, <coughs> education is a great contraception. Start with educated yeah. girls and women. I yeah, mean, yeah. You, you've solved a lot of problems with that one move right there. And right? I think there's been there's been you know sort of active discouragement of those sorts of policies because I think in the growth mentality you got to have population growth to keep the growth going. So you know you, you see on the news a lot you know oh the popu you know population is declining in a certain country and this is a real disaster. How do we get population growth back again? And I think that's that's part of the problem. That we're not, you know, we could we could go the other way and and, and accept that we do need to stabilize population and, and institute the policies that would that would help us get there. Okay, other questions? I have a question in terms of the, I mean, Dimitri mentioned education and the fact that we all educate our children because that's a good thing. But are we educating them in the right way? Mm -hmm. Could we not think about different ways of educating them instead of like, well, you're going to grow up, you're going to get a job, you're going to perpetuate growth. So maybe we could think of a different thing. Maybe we could educate our farmers to think instead of maximising yield, we need to think about the whole societal well-being. You need to look after the soil, yeah. you need to look after these things. I it would be, so I just wonder if there's, you know, at yeah, that level, we, we should be looking at whole-scale <laughs> yeah, yeah, preservation of our education. Absolutely, and I think if we started with systems education, yeah. rather Absolutely. Trying to narrow things down, we try to broaden broaden things out. And I, I have seen a couple of there's a high school in Vermont that actually is based on systems education, uh, wow. but it's very it's very rare, you know. Mm. So <clears throat> I think if we did more of that from the from the very beginning. Yeah, gentleman there in the green and brown. So the lady at the back. 
Yeah, just following on from what uh, the previous person asked, I guess I was just kind of curious because obviously I know that some of you are engaging with um, policy and decision making, which is great. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons why uh, an MP may understand the difficulties with uh, using GDPR as a sort of a goal to kind of uh, work on. Um, but I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering, um, in terms of education, um, seeing as a lot of our um, policy uh, politicians and their political advisors tend to end up studying things like um, PPE at university. Um, and I think the institutions that you're all um, um, associated to probably teach some aspect of PPE, I guess, as a, as a course. How much of the thinking that you guys are, uh, are using actually taught in the economics part of those PPE courses, or are they just kind of learning very, like, very cool standard boring? Um, They're all everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Will it be a way of, like, the, for the very up and coming, you know, uh, next generation of politicians, a way of trying to get them to think differently? God, I'm going to say something over. Great here, but you know, you asked about economic forecasting. How, do, how did that go? It went all right. I was there in the Treasury when the Treasury was still doing good things. Why? Because the Treasury can do good things if the politicians want them to. The Stern review came out of it, the, the one less review, the injection of funds into the health service that all came out because an active chancellor used that ministry to do what I thought was the right thing, um, as opposed potentially to starving you know investment in core assets. Uh, through pointless austerity, um, but yeah, I probably shouldn't be quoted on that. Um, but your point about, I mean, there was a problem. We kind of used to sort of jokingly say, you know, it, it, the Treasury was full of PPs, I did PP as well, but I mean, it was full of PPs and lawyers and people whose kind of understanding of the economy, and, and weren't still people who went to business school, whose understanding of the economy was the classical model of, you know, perfect rationality and perfect optimization and market efficiency and all these things which are great things to sort of start as principles to then demolish because that's not how the world is but they stopped at the interesting bit which is demolishing them and then they go into you know ministries and they sort of you know start developing a swagger and becoming rather senior and starting to start to influence policy so it goes back to your point about education I mean, education is a, if we live in a path dependent system, that means the choices and decisions we make now have amplified uh, impact down the line. So we really have to start early. And the way we educate people and the way the mindset that, that we develop, along with the kind of um, technological innovation, it's not just innovation in tech, it's innovation in systems and behaviors and institutions. If you start that early, you can make a real tangible difference. But if you delay or you send mixed model signals or you just carry on doing things the way we've done them, um, you start locking yourself into systems which become really hard to reverse, and that's, that's, the that's where we are. That's the addiction. Yeah, that's the addiction. I agree. So, do any, does anyone know of any economics degrees that are founded on ecological economics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are plenty, but it's not the basic. I mean, the PP example is a good one. It's not your, it's not your economics 101. Your economics 101 should be bad unless it's got the other bits, because it's utterly dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a mission. That sounds like a very good mission. Right, I think I saw Ed and then, and then the gentleman in front of Ed, so Ed first, please. Yes, uh, uh, so thank you for a really uh, uh, fascinating uh, talk and, uh, and the conversation. Um, the GDP that was conventionally me measured, uh, uh, as you say, you, you uh, described all the the deficiencies of it, but it's become ingrained in people's thinking and therefore associated with certain things. So, for example, the word recession, which means negative GDP growth in two successive quarters, is associated with something really bad in the mm -hmm. man to happen, yeah. uh, to me personally. Uh, also, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, that GDP is inversely related to unemployment, in other words, GDP uh, contraction is associated with I'm going to lose my job is very, very much ingrained, ingrained in part of some of the traditional economic orthodoxy. So my question is, um, actually, are these relationships such as between conventional GDP and unemployment, are they actually true? Um, uh, and how um, does one get across uh, to a different style of thinking about this? when there are these ingrained uh, ideas about the uh, neg about negative GDP growth? 
Um, <laughs> well, I think it's uh, like Peter Victor's model was showing that if all you do is, is stop GDP growth, then because of all of the interconnections in the system, I mean, some of those relationships yeah. probably do are, are connected at, at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean they have to be. And I think there have been situations in the past where at least uh, jobs and GDP were not, not necessarily correlated. Uh, but, but I think the, that the problem is that in, I'm not sure if it's the public mind, it probably is the public mind, but it's been sort of, you know, sort of uh, <coughs> hammered into them that GDP growth is good, GDP growth is bad. I mean, GDP decline is bad. And they don't really understand what that means other than, you know, it has some, it has something to do with how I'm, I'm going to be doing it future, I might lose my job. So, um, I mean, education might might help there um, significantly as well uh, to, to just show people that GDP growth is not what we should be worried about. You know, we should be worried about improvement in well-being. Part of that comes from th some things that are measured in GDP, but, you know, just focusing only on GDP and ignoring uh, income inequality, ignoring loss of natural and social capital, that's the problem. And that's that distinction between GDP and GPI, and GPI was just an effort to, to try to bring in, you know, some of those factors. And say, well, what's this genuine progress <coughs> indicator? So that includes inequality and loss of natural capital and social capital. So it's saying if you include those things, we haven't been making progress. We've been in a recession, you know, for decades now uh, so when it comes to the, the, the overall picture. So I think that at least making that kind of, of uh, information relevant, uh, uh, you know, uh, known uh, to, the, to the larger population uh, would go a long way, and getting it into the, the politicians would, would be even better. And like I said, there are some, um, you know, vanguard governments that are taking this on board and saying, you know, we want to measure well-being, we want to use that as our goal, not, not just GDP. Uh, and, and it's not that we shouldn't measure GDP, but, you know, we shouldn't base all of our, our policies on that at the expense of other other things that we know contribute to well-being. Mm. Okay, gentlemen, so I'm going to take a, I'll take a few more questions and then come back okay. to you. Just one, one really short one on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, no, sorry. We're too enthusiastic. No, we are. <laughs> and I'm conscious I've said too much already. But I'm, I'm happy to pick up the GDP point if you like. But I, 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 okay, let's come, well, let's see. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you I'll give sure the final remarks. I just want to gather some more questions if that's okay. Oh, my goodness, right. Okay, gentlemen I saw before, the gentleman in front here, Lady in green, Chap here, I think it's called Adam, uh, and then and then this, uh, and then overnight. Right, so we've got six, Golly, and there's drinks to come. So um, here, first of all. <laughs> well, first a comment about education. Um, I have a number of friends who work at LSE, and I noticed that the uh, uh, environmental economics course is actually in the Department of Geography. Not in the <laughs> Do you need to say more? Yes. Or uh, noted. <laughs> University of Cambridge. They, have a, they actually have a land economy department, which is quite separate from the economics. Just as a com comment, really. Um, but I, I think, actually, Dimitri has put his finger on it. I mean, I worked as an environmental uh, economics advisor uh, in the DOE. I worked in the commission, uh, and I worked also for the environment agency. And, I mean, the issue is, is not really the economics, truthfully. I mean, the economics is just the language, truthfully. It's the politics. I mean, and recently, of course, we've seen... Uh, with the sort of uh, COVID inquiry, what's actually been going on at the centre of our politics, and it's pretty, pretty ugly, frankly. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I hate to say this, this is politics and education, really, is what we're talking about here now. We're not talking about economics. We're actually talking about basic competence in terms of government. Yeah. The use of economics. Yeah, exactly. So that's my comment, really. Okay. Thank you. And sorry, I should have said, helpful if everyone could say who they, who they are. Right. Well, my name is Bill Watts. Uh, uh, I worked, as I said before, okay. as an economic advisor in the government. Thank you. Um, gentleman here. Yeah, my name is Alaric Lester. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't help thinking that the main barrier to things really changing is the powerful influences and, and decision makers. I just wondered if you think that's true. And if so, how do we win the narrative against the trusses, the Sunaks, the Trumps, uh, the Mail, the, the Telegraph, etc. Who'd like to comment on that? <laughs> Go for it, Bob. Well, I, I think you're talking about the special interests you know, that, that do currently control the, the political system because you know money and politics are, are not disconnected. Um, and, and more
more so in some countries than, than in others. Uh, but take the fossil fuel sector, you know, that is, is consciously preventing, you know, the transition to renewable energy, you know, by, by yeah. buying, you know, uh, supporting uh, political campaigns, by misinformation campaigns, <coughs> advertising, you know, and, and they're still being subsidized, you know, to the tune of trillions of dollars a year uh, <coughs> to continue, you know, doing something that we know is, is really uh, the right thing to do. Uh, and so uh, I think that's uh, one of the key, you know, sort of addictive elements. You know, why do we keep doing that? And we know that, we know at this larger level that that's, you know, we've got to, we've got to stop. Well, it's kind of locked in to the system. And, and how do you break out of that? Uh, we've got to have a larger vision, you know, with a much larger segment of the population. You've got to build the critical mass that says, no, we're not doing that anymore. You know, we really need to, to create this other vision of the world that's based on renewable energy, that's based on equity, that's based on all the things we're talking about. And to get there, that's going to have to motivate you know, the, the, uh, uh, the <coughs> to overcome those, those special interests. This, this, is, this is what Green Finance was meant to do for this, isn't it? That, that, that hype seems to slightly recede. I won't ask you to comment on that. I'm just, well, there's one just sector, the chemicals out. industry, yeah. I've been advising since 1999, who now petition for better regulation to stop being undercut by people doing the wrong things. Mm -hmm. So leadership doesn't come from politicians. I mean, they are often gatekeepers of vested interests, but if the vested interest can be educated to do things better, cheaper, with less de-risk, in a de-risk sort of way, which brings us into the kind of vision things we've been talking about, um, then, then the, the bad guys can become the good guys if they buy into a vision that is essentially backcasted in this case. So leadership comes from all sectors of society. Even the bad guys can be good guys. Okay, we have about 10 minutes and four questions that I can see at the moment. Well, we've so... talked about GTV because <laughs> it's, been, it's been supplemented with two others. Okay. Like, or I can wait, and there'll probably okay. be more. Yeah, there okay. probably will. There'll probably be, be more. Sweep. Okay. I tell you what, do a sweep, sweep. up. I'm a GTV nutter, so I'll, I'll kick in. All of your final remarks, okay? All right, Nadine Green. Um, Bruce England, they, my question is about your, what you're talking about in terms of creating a positive vision for the future that people can work towards. And I'm not sure if you're aware of Rob um, Hopkins' work in terms of transition towns, where he does just this. And I'm not sure if you're aware of him. He kind of has a sort of, he pretends that it's 2030 and he's broadcasting from the future and telling, mm -hmm. broadcasting back to today and telling people how wonderful 2030 yeah. is. and. So that people have something so positive to work towards and yeah. he's a really fantastic speaker but his reach and the transition time movement is fascinating and promoting agroecological um uh, farming and uh people uh, equitable access to good food and yeah. all things and education and all of those things who is this again he's called rob hopkins yeah. and he's um but my question <coughs> is really it's one thing to target it's connected a little bit with your question in terms of targeting Prime Ministers and Presidents and trying to get them to project this positive change for the future that, that, that the community, can, the society can work towards, but that vision will only last their political term, mm -hmm. for instance. So which institutions do we, apart from just the obvious schools, which institutions should we target to create that positive change at cross-generational levels? It's no good in just stimulating it through like primary schools and younger generation if they're not the ones that are actually voting. Well, I think that's what the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is trying to do. I mean, it's got to be civil society and NGOs and, you know, academics and the, the whole, you know, the critical mass has to be a, a big chunk of society. I don't think it's going to be, and I don't think it's going to come from, you know, currently elected politicians. And like you say, even if they, there were good ones, they're going, to, they're going to be voted out potentially next time. But how do you prevent them from getting voted out and better ones getting voted in, well, you have to build this, this you know, critical mass, I think, of, uh, and that's will be a movement. And like I said, there are, there are a couple of governments that are kind of headed that way, but I think it's not going to be only the government. Um, I think that, uh, you know, all sectors of society, I think, have to participate and build that shared vision. That's, that's the shared part. Uh, yes. I think, it, I think it's, it's, it's hard, but I think that's, it can be done, and it has been done, I think, in the past. And, cases where there's a you know a social consensus really you know ending slavery for example uh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah 
Adam. Uh, Adam Donnan, Institution of Environmental Sciences. So what I always like about the Burma with lecture is its boundary uh, spanning element, and it's, it's great to have some economists here talking to a room full of scientists. Um, I'm curious to use this opportunity to, uh, you've told us a lot about, you know, your own discipline, but looking at our discipline, where do you feel that there's kind of a lack of evidence? What should our research priorities be that would enable you in your own work? Well, <clears throat> I don't like that your discipline, our discipline thing, first of all, uh, because I try to think of myself more as a transdisciplinary uh, <clears throat> scientist, scholar, researcher, and potentially activist. And I think that's what came out of your, your uh, recommendations as well, that it's not enough for you know, scientists to focus on one small part of the problem. You've got to look at the whole system. And you're not going to look at the whole system if you're trained in a very, you know, in a very narrow, narrow element only. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have some special specializations, but you still have to have uh, the broad context that you're that you're, uh, you're you're working into. So I think that gets back to the education, you know, in systems rather than in, in disciplines. Yeah, everything's connected. Okay, I think a question here, and then. And then I think we might get you to make final reflections and have a drink. Which, uh, yes, please. Hello, um, so I'm Tom, I'm from the University of York, I'm a student, and I'm also an agricultural field research scientist. So my sort of question was, do you think by 2030 we will say the SDGs have been a success? And what do you think the plan should be going forward? Do you think having these targets... Um, beyond 2030 and then um, implementing education, do you think that's um, an, a good enough way forward? And if you think that education is the key to making success, how do you target that to work at government level, but then also down to, say, the farmer level to educate them to ensure that, you know, they're not just following what their government says, they actually understand and appreciate why they're doing what they're doing? Well, the, the SDGs are due to be reevaluated uh, coming up soon. Um, I, I think they, um, I don't think they handled it the best in the best possible way. <laughs> I think the goals are great um, when you get down to the indicators and the, you know, the, the actual measures. Uh, there are no countries that are really measuring all of that stuff, and it would be too expensive to do anyway. And, and I'm not sure that was really uh, the point so much as setting up these broader these broader goals. And I think they also failed to communicate those goals with the broader population. And I think that's the more critical thing going forward. Uh, whether they're going to actually achieve, you know, their 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 targets by 2030, probably probably not. Uh, but they were aspirational anyway, and I think they should really shift the focus a bit more toward, um, you know, engaging the general population and saying, hey, these these are important goals. We are the general population. I would argue if they were was put out there for them, they would, you know, they would share those those goals, most of those goals. Uh, and I think making that apparent to the to the uh, the rest of the population and to the politicians, I think, would go a long way uh, in in building the shared vision. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, Adam, I should just check. Do we have any online <coughs> questions at the moment? No. Okay. In which case, I think you probably have some other <coughs> questions. Um, hi, I'm Ellie. Um, I don't know how much you know about like the London uh, Olympic Park and Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, but the reason why I'm asking is because it was, you know, talked about as being the most sustainable Olympics. It completely transformed the Stratford area, and you know, through the building of the Olympics to you know its continuation since 2012, it's all about fostering sustainability and also the economic growth that's come with that, you, um, like economic prosperity, you know, you've got the UCL East campus that's just opened, UAL, VNA, um, all within like a s sustainable um, like park. And so, you know, you talk about like this like utopia for the future, like, I don't know if you've got any comments on it, like what, if you think, what you think about it. Um, you, have you had a, a wrong in it? Do you have a view on it yourself? Um, I kind of asked because I'm actually based on the UCL East campus at the moment and I'm looking into a documentary about the sustainability in the park and I was thinking about the economic prosperity that has come with it. So I'd like to talk to you more about that because I'm, I'm currently uh, teaching a program at UCL East. So, yeah, I'm out there a couple times a week. 
really a loud Are you in the new building? The, the yeah, the Marshgate the Marshgate rooms. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a King's student, yeah. but I'm doing intercollegiate at the moment, so I'm doing a documentary module about sustainability there. So, Is there an emerging sense that it's lived up to its promise, or is it too early to tell? Or? You, tell you tell me, I don't know. <laughs> You haven't done the analysis. I, I'm looking into it at the moment, uh, and it's mainly, I'm, you know, how far is it going with the, you know, they're bringing in, um, you know, different organisations to kind of continue the okay. economic prosperity, and it's the legacy council is getting uh, dispersed soon, and so it's just kind of looking at, you know, is this, yeah. is you know, something that should be looked at as the future you know, to be used, you know, not just in Stratford, but elsewhere. So it could, it could be a, a really excellent model, depending on what you, what you find. Okay. okay. Um, I like the new building. That's really cool. <laughs> 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 to be all light built environment, that's the trouble, right, isn't it? Um, okay, I think, unless you want to comment specifically on that, I'm going to look for sort of closing yeah. comments. Um, Dimitri, you can say more about GDP, you can say more about <laughs> any of the things that the have been raised. You just have to do it in two minutes. Okay, the reason I'm a GDP nutter is because I think this is fixation, as I've said already, can be so damaging. You're shooting the messenger. GDP is, we know what it is, we know what it is, and there's lots of things it isn't, and it never will be. But it does a good job in measuring what it's meant to measure, which is output expenditure uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, output expenditure and uh, production. Um, Sorry. I'll get so to oh, no, 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 right. the point. Now, yeah. the, point, the, the point here that was a brilliant point is that people are terrified of you know degrowth because it means recession, yeah. recession and unemployment and so on. Yeah. And of course it does, right? We are all entangled in the fossil fuel resource extensive environmentally degrading economy as consumers and as employ uh, as employees. And when that economy slows down, we lose our jobs and we consume less. That's absolutely the way it's going to be. And GDP does a great job in measuring that. Um, that's not where the problem is. Um, if we wanted to decouple, absolutely decouple GDP from resource use, we could. Is it a surprise that we never have? Of course not. We've never tried. We've never remotely bothered. In fact, where we've even done the slightest amount of policy effort, we've managed to almost completely transition, we will shortly completely transition electricity generation, because all the investment is now predominantly in renewables, we will transition uh, the cars we drove. If you told people 10 years ago we'd do that, They'd look as if you know. They'd look at you as if your man probably escort you out of the building. They would, you know, it would have been heretical. Tiny bit of policy effort has made huge changes. Just think what a bit of induced innovation could do anywhere else. Now, is it going to be totally easy? Of course not. We will have to, uh, you know, reduce our addiction to material goods. In particular, the challenge we've got to be honest about this is going to be in poverty reduction. People will need to be housed. They will need heating. They will need cooling. They will need mobility. Um, they will need access to energy, they will need access to the internet. All of these things are currently incredibly resource and energy intensive. And so we really need to innovate to make sure, and the urban form is really important, if you live in sprawling cities based on the Atlanta model rather than a more Asian or European model of compact urban development, compact connected urban development, you are screwed. I mean, we can't do that. So as humanity, we really have to put our minds to how we square this circle. And it's not going to be easy. But it's not necessarily going to be worse, and GDP will carry on doing what it does, but hopefully, if we make the right choices, uh, GDP will be measuring activity that is not environmentally degrading, that is not resource extensive, that is not uh, carbon emitting. Um, will we meet our SDG targets? Yeah, if we want to. No, if we don't. It's utterly within our gift, because the bottom line and the final word that I will say in this is this is not ultimately a technological or an economic <coughs> This is a political, behavioural and cultural problem. It's up to us. It's in our gift to do this. And we will create a better world if we do. But for very good psychological, uh, social psychological and political reasons, um, we're not going to do it unless we absolutely you know, uh, uh, galvanise and lead and change our approach to understanding the nature of the problem and the opportunities and risks associated with acting and not acting uh, and take action very, very quickly and, and you know, uh, ambitiously. Thank you. No. Well, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, individually, we are expert at backblasting. You know, we, we want a decent home, we want our kids to be safe and can grow up, we want food, we want water, we do <coughs> the token things for our own individual health and not having too much to drink and that sort of stuff and, and to work out good relationships and the pension when you reach my age. So we kind of do think of the future and we do try to optimise things. 
It's just collectively what <coughs> crap it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and I, I draw a parallel with the work I do in India, some of the work I do in India, where, you know, for millennia, a shared common water resource in an arid landscape, we will have stewarded it together. And then Adam gets a, a powerful tube well, and then suddenly Anthony gets one, and, and, and Joseph gets one, and, and we turn it into a competitive society. Now, that's the way we've created the world. So in trying to pursue our own, backcast our own individual well-being, we, we've overlooked the carrying capacity of the system. So it really does come down to backcasting from a big vision. And the SDGs are the best so far. They're not perfect. They're a long way from perfect. But they're an evolution from the Millennium Development Goals, which is where we got to in 2015. And who knows what we'll do next? And who knows we'll be involved with that? Hopefully some of us will be involved with that. But what we do need is, is to be collectively intelligent. We have the intelligence we're just not good at deploying it and then backcasting from it, creating a future that fits that vision rather than trying to <coughs> retrofit our suboptimal norms and marginally improve them here and there. It's, it's a great call for innovation. It's a great call for profit because there's new business and new product, jobs, and there's nothing wrong with profit. Um, Ooh, that sounds so, like teeing up to so the So long next as we're election. doing the right things. Exactly to oh, generate the profit. So, you know, a big a big call for the backcast, a big call for the SDGs, and perfect though they are, a big call for us to be collectively intelligent. Well said. And I, I think that gets back to the need to create a shared vision. Yeah. I think that's what you're, you're calling for. Yeah. And how do we do that collectively and, and democratically? And I think uh, democracy is a great idea. Try it. Let's try it yeah. <laughs> always said that. That's a, that's Give it a go. Really good note. Like the capitalism as well. I it? know. That's <laughs> crazy. Um, and I think I think we could do a much better job. How do we make those collective decisions in a way that's not influenced by the special interests that want to keep the system in this, mm -hmm. the way that it is now? Even if we all agree uh, that that it should go differently. And in, in the book, I mentioned one study. Uh, of, they, they looked at policies that were implemented in the United States relative to public opinion at the time and relative to the, you know, the interests of the, the special interests that wanted things happening. It was all, all, always the special interests yeah. policies that held the, held the day and not, not what the general public wanted. So it hasn't really been a democracy no. uh, for, for no. quite a while. And uh, I think we can, need to get back to that and, and maybe think of some some really radically new and different ways of, of doing democracy, like deliberative democracy and sociocracy and, and other ways of making collective decisions. You know, that, that, uh, that we, I think we can do now with the technology that we have, you know, on a, on a scale that we could never have done in the past. So I think we need to use, like, we were, like I was saying, we need to use the technology as a, as a survey of the kind of goals that we, that we set forward and not, and not simply to, to make more money you know, to buy things that we, that we really don't need. Uh, and I think, um, getting back to, if I can end with the GDP thing. <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, we have to worry more about inequality and social capital. We have to worry more about natural capital. And, 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 you know, and we have to bring those into the, the measures that are guiding policy. And right now, I think the GDP is guiding policy. You, yeah. can't, you can't argue with that. Yeah. The current version of GDP. Yeah. So we need a radically different version of uh, a measure that we all agree, you know, should be driving policy that does include all of the things that we have agreed, uh, you know, as a, as a society, are important to our, to our, our ongoing well-being. Mm -hmm. and, and that can help us uh, make progress toward the shared vision. And I think those two things are not disconnected either. Because if you say, here's the shared vision, what you want in a measure is, are we making progress toward that shared vision? And right now, we're not, you know, GDP is not measuring progress toward the shared vision I think that we want. It's measuring progress toward a different vision that's leading us over the cliff. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's the key, isn't it? What do we all agree is important? Yeah. Yes. And how do we get that? Okay, I am, I am going to wrap things up now. You'll have plenty more opportunity to, <laughs> to debate this, I hope, over a drink. But I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Bob, so much. You've yeah, given us a huge <laughs> amount of food for thought. Um, thank you to both, the, both of you as our respondents, to Joseph and Anthony for their work on the vision. 
um, a big thanks to the um, uh, to, to our venue, to the Institute of Physics, um, for providing uh, <coughs> this fantastic venue. I hope you all agree this has been a great forum for yes, great. for doing it, and thank you all. And there, we're coming, and there are some drinks, and I hope some canapes to further nourish our conversation <laughs> without over-consuming. Um, <laughs> so thank you all very much indeed. Oh no, no, no. <laughs>